Hey everybody, welcome back to Chem 103. We are in chapter 6, officially through the halfway point. So congratulations, you got this far. We'll now talk about the language of chemistry. Pretty much naming compounds, writing chemical formulas. Let's get to it. The International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry sets the rules for naming compounds. So don't come for me, I didn't make these rules. There are also plenty of other kind of common names and other ways to name uh, compounds. If you're in my class, we're only talking about these rules. So when you're doing your homework and when you're doing your exam, don't just Google it. Make sure you use the rules that we actually talk about. Most inorganic compounds don't contain carbon. The exceptions are carbon dioxide and carbonates, which have this ion, CO3 2 minus. So by and large, the compounds we will be naming will not have carbon. This flow chart helps to classify all the various types of compounds. If you remember in chapter three, we had a very similar flowchart looking at matter. And we broke matter down into pure substances and mixtures. And under the category of pure substances, we have compounds and elements. Imagine from compounds, we can have inorganic and organic. We're looking at inorganic compounds and acids, three major classes, ionic, molecular, and aqueous. These five subclasses are the ones that we will be dealing with today. The five common classes of inorganic compounds, we've got binary ionic, and I'm writing my shorthand that you'll see throughout this lecture. So that's a binary ionic compound, ternary ionic compounds, binary molecular or binary molecular compound, binary acid, and a ternary oxy acid. Make sure you get those kind of locked in I'm going to use those abbreviations because it's a lot to write. Let's break down some of these words a little bit so that when we get into classifying our compounds, it makes a little bit more sense. I like color, so we're going to switch. Binary. Wherever you see that, think two elements. in the compound. Everywhere that you see ternary, three elements. That will help you tremendously. And the last little tidbit, acid, think hydrogen first. Acids always start with their hydrogen first. And those are just a few little tidbits. We're gonna build from here. We'll start with the ionic compounds. Binary ionic compounds have two elements, like I said. Binary, think two. They have one metal and one nonmetal. Here we've got NaCl, Na, that's sodium. That's the metal. Cl, 
that symbol is for chlorine, that's a nonmetal. Same thing for AlCl3. Aluminum is a metal. Cl nonmetal. Ternary ionic compounds have three elements. You're still going to see the metal first. You'll see a metal with two nonmetals, or, and you'll understand this terminology a little bit later on, a metal plus a polyatomic anion. Now you haven't been introduced to that term yet, the polyatomic anion, but just stick that in your back pocket. It'll come up, I promise. K, that's potassium, that's a metal. The N is nitrogen, the O, that's oxygen, those are nonmetals. So these are some examples of binary ionic compounds and ternary ionic compounds. Moving on to molecular compounds. Binary molecular compounds have two metals and they are both, or excuse me, two elements and they are both non metals. Some examples would be ammonia, which is NH3, and water, H2O. You don't see any metals there. All of these are either hydrogen or you're looking at something from the right hand side of the periodic table like oxygen or nitrogen. Then we move on to the aqueous acids. Remember, acids always start with a hydrogen. Whether it's a binary acid with a metal and a nonmetal, or excuse me, a metal, a hydrogen, <laughs> it starts with it starts with a hydrogen, and then I say metal and nonmetal. Sometimes the mouth doesn't want to cooperate. So a binary acid, you've got a hydrogen and a nonmetal. And our example for that is HCl. The other hint when you're looking at a formula that you have an acid is that AQ in parentheses that tells you it's an aqueous acid. A ternary oxyacid, we're looking at three elements, hydrogen, oxygen, and another nonmetal. Again, you see that aqueous still. So it starts with the hydrogen, it has aqueous in parentheses, that tells you it's an acid. The number of elements, whether it's two or three, tells you binary or ternary. Let's classify these compounds. I'll walk through a few of these examples so you can see the logic that you need to use to classify. I always look at how many elements do I have, and are they metals or nonmetals? In this first example, I've got one metal, which is sodium, and one nonmetal. So it's got to be something binary because there's only two elements. It's a metal plus a nonmetal, which makes it ionic. 
if I'm using my shorthand here, it's B I C. C O. That's two non metals. The only thing that fits the bill here would be binary molecular. The third compound, we're starting with the metal, and then phosphorus and oxygen are both nonmetals. If I'm starting with the metal, and then I've got two nonmetals, I've got three total elements. So it has to be something that's ternary. My only choices are ternary ionic compound or ternary oxyacid. An acid would start with a hydrogen. So it can't be that. It's got to be ionic. Last example, we've got hydrogen plus a nonmetal. We also see the AQ. So it's some kind of acid. There's only two elements, the hydrogen plus the nonmetal, so it has to be a binary acid. That's how you can talk your way through to classify these different compounds. In class and live lecture, we'll do more exactly like this. Moving on to ions. We talked about ions at the end of chapter five. An ion is an atom or a group of atoms with a charge. If you have a positively charged ion, it's called a cation. Negatively charged ion, that's an anion. A group of atoms with a negative charge is a polyatomic anion. Poly means many. This flow chart describes the types of ions you have. We've got the cations and the anions, which again, positive and negative. And within those, you can have monoatomic, which means one atom, or polyatomic many atoms. And the same is true for both cations and anions. We'll start with monoatomic cations. At the end of chapter 5 we talked about metals losing valence electrons to form positive ions. Well another way to say that is that metal atoms lose valence electrons forming cations. It's our new vocabulary word. The way that we name cations is using the parent atom. So if the name of the element which is sodium, like Na, then Na plus would be the sodium ion. If you have magnesium 2 plus that you want to name it, the name of the element is magnesium and then you just put the word ion. So it's element name plus the word ion. And this should be a refresher for you in terms of the charge and how we calculate the charge. The charge of a metal ion from the representative elements, these the ones that have an A after their group name, is equal to the charge number. So Na plus, for example, that's sodium ion. Sodium is in group 1A. That means there's one valence electron. 
And when sodium and all the other group 1A elements lose that valence electron, they have a plus one charge. There are some exceptions. And those exceptions are mainly within the transition elements. If you remember from chapter four, when we were doing all of the electron configurations, that's the D block, okay? There are others like lead that form multiple ions. If you have a metal that forms multiple ions, you have to differentiate between the different ions when naming. For this, we're gonna use the stock system. And all you have to do is indicate the charge using Roman numerals. Copper can form copper one and copper two plus. The copper one ion, you have the name copper, then you have the charge as a Roman numeral and the word ion. The system that we're using is called the stock system. There are a few exceptions that you need to know. Zinc, silver, and cadmium only form one ion. They are transition metals, but they only form one ion. You need to recognize these. And we do not use the stock system when referring to these ions. Now, just in case you don't remember your Roman numerals, I'll give you a few. There's one, two, three, four, and five. You should be good to go there. There's another system called the Latin system or the suffix system. And that just uses the suffix IC or OUS to indicate the charge. The cation with the lower charge receives the OUS suffix. The cation with the higher charge gets the IC suffix. So copper one ion in the stock system would be the cuprous ion with the Latin or the suffix system. Copper two ion would be the cupric ion. I'm not going to specifically test you on this system, but you may see this in your homework. If you also take other chemistry classes, you may see this terminology um, on some of the chemicals that you use in lab class. So I want you to at least have seen it and have some semblance of understanding somewhere in deep inside of your brain. I think I saw this before. 
I think the stock system is more descriptive. So that's the one that we'll focus on. Let's name some ions. First thing you want to do when you're naming a monoatomic cation is to see if you're dealing with a transition metal or not. Aluminum. Definitely not a transition metal. And I use TM for transition metal. Since it's not a transition metal, we can just write the element plus ion. So this is the aluminum ion. Zinc. It is a transition metal. But now we have to go through the Rolodex of the exceptions to see if it's on that list. Zinc, silver, and cadmium are all exceptions. They only form one ion. So for this ion, we again just use the name zinc followed by ion. The third one, chromium, that is a transition metal. Not on our list of exceptions. The exceptions are zinc, silver, and cadmium. This, however, is chromium. So we name it using the element name followed by the charge in parentheses. That's six. And then you write ion. We'll, we'll do a lot more practice in class. Let's hop on over from cations to anions. Remember from chapter five that nonmetals gain valence electrons to form negative ions, which are called anions. The way that we name these anions, you take the root of the name, which is pretty much the first syllable of the element, and you add IDE at the end. So we've got common monoatomic anions in this table below. This will be your friend when you're first learning how to name compounds. But I'll show you how you get from the element name to the ion name. Br, that's bromine. We want to use the root of the name, so the first syllable, brome. We get rid of the I-N-E. We don't care about that. We just want the first syllable. We add I-D-E and the word ion. That's how you end up with the bromide ion. I'll do that again. Nitrogen. We use the root and we get rid of everything else. We replace everything else with IDE and add the word ion. That's how you get the nitride ion. I'm not going to do all of these, but hopefully you can see the pattern. In terms of calculating the charge, any nonmetal, you're just going to take the group number, the one with the A after it, and subtract 8. So let's stick with our nitrogen example. 
nitrogen is in group 5A. If I want to figure out the charge of any nonmetal in group 5A, I take that 5, subtract 8, and that gives me a negative 3 charge. And just as another refresher, if you're in group 5A, that means you also have 5 valence electrons. When you become an ion as a group 5A nonmetal, you want to gain electrons to complete that octet. You want to fill out the rest of those valence electrons. So you will gain three electrons to become a happy negative ion. This chart will be your friend as well. It has common monoatomic cations and anions and their charges. No, you cannot use this on the exam, but this will be great practice. If you keep practicing with it, you won't need it on the exam. Polyatomic anions. Now we're getting to the fun stuff. These polyatomic anions generally have one or more elements combined with oxygen. So if it's combined with oxygen, you may also see it referred to as an oxyanion. Many of these oxyanions have names that end in the suffix A-T-E, like nitrate and sulfate. Again, notice that they have negative charges. There are two common polyatomic ions that end in I-D-E because they're just a little bit different. There's hydroxide and cyanide. This table of common polyatomic ions you will have access to, so you do not need to memorize. You might start to recognize these as you do your homework and you do your practice problems and everything else, but you will get this same chart on the exam. I also want to point out that there is one polyatomic ion that is a cation, and that's ammonium. So just make sure that you note that. Again, this table is your friend. You might want to print this one out and put it in your notebook. So some oxyanions end in A-T-E. Others end in I-T-E. The oxyanions that end in I-T-E have one less oxygen than the oxyanions that end in A-T-E. So we looked at NO3 minus a couple of slides ago, and that was the nitrate ion. And SO4 2 minus as the sulfate ion. ATE and there are three oxygens. For the nitrite ion, there are two oxygens, so one less. We'll do that again. Sulfite, I-T-E, three oxygens. Sulfate, A-T-E, four oxygens. 
So the ITE and the ATE don't tell you the exact number of oxygens, but it tells you whether you have one less. So if you know what the ATE form is, let's say the nitrate is NO3 minus, then you know nitrite is NO2 minus. But notice what didn't change. The charge. The charge for both sets of ions, the it and the eight, is the same. The formula for chlorate is ClO3 minus. What is the formula for the chlorite ion? Chlorite should be one less oxygen. It should have the same charge. One fewer oxygen instead of three, we have two. And then we put a negative sign. So remember, to go from ATE to ITE, you've got to have one less oxygen. But the charge is the same. Let's move into naming. We'll start easy with naming the binary ionic compounds. When you're naming an ionic compound, whether it's binary ionic or ternary ionic, you are going to have the cation name followed by the anion name. So that's always the order. The cation first, anion second. You name both of these ions, the cation and the anion. So magnesium is the cation. And you go into your Rolodex of things to name. So pull up the monoatomic cation naming rules. Magnesium is not a transition metal. So we just simply name it by calling it its name, magnesium. And it is an ion, so magnesium ion. Oxygen is the anion. It's a nonmetal. The way we name these is we start with the name of the element. We get rid of everything except for the first syllable. Replace it with IDE and plop ion after that. So that's the oxide ion. Then you drop the word ion from both of these. and you smush them together. So the name of this compound is magnesium oxide. We named the cation, we named the anion, Remove the word anion or remove the word ion from both of those and smush the words together. Let's name cinnabar, which is HGS. Mercury. Cation. 
it's a transition metal. So we name it using its charge. But we don't know the charge yet. We have to look at the anion. The anion is sulfur. Sulfur, if you look it up, it's a group 6A element. To figure out the charge on the sulfur, you take that 6 in the group number, subtract 8, and that gives you a negative 2 charge. This compound is a neutral compound. You don't see any charge up there. So the positive charge from the cation must be equal but opposite to the anion charge. So if sulfide, or the sulfur, is minus 2, I just named it right there, then the mercury must be plus 2. And then we name the sulfur. So sulfur, we only want the first syllable. So we get rid of the UR and we keep the sulf. We add IDE and ion. Then we combine these two words. Mercury 2, sulfide. We can write chemical formulas from the binary ionic compound names. Since an ionic compound is composed of positive and negative ions, we can name those, we can take the names of those ions and write the formula from them. The formula unit, so what you would see for table salt as an example, that's the simplest representative particle of an ionic compound. We know that salt comes as crystals, right? So you see lots of sodium ions and chloride ions in that crystal. But the simplest representative particle of that crystal is NaCl. That's a formula unit. A formula unit is neutral. That means its charge is equal to zero. What charge? There is no charge. So the total positive charge must equal the total negative charge in the formula unit. With our example, sodium is a group 1A element. That means its charge is going to be plus 1. Chlorine, on the other hand, is in group 7A its charge is going to be 7 minus 8, which equals negative 1. So a positive 1, negative 1, that equals 0 charge. As you're writing these chemical formulas, you always want to double check that your formula actually has a neutral charge. Let's practice. We've got barium chloride. Look up barium on your periodic table. It's a group 2A element. It's a metal. That means 
that the charge is plus two. It's not a transition metal, so we already know. The barium ion that's what it looks like now we need to figure out the anion chloride how do you figure out what element that is you look at the root chlor comes from chlorine So we know the symbol is Cl, but we need to figure out the charge. Chlorine is in group 7A. So its charge, because it's a non-metal, we figure out the charge by taking the group number, subtract 8, and that gives you a negative 1 charge. If I put this together as a formula unit, the barium is a positive 2, chlorine is a negative 1. Uh oh. This is not a neutral formula unit. This can't be right. I have to do something to balance out the charge. Because right now, this formula unit is positively charged. And that can't be. We're going to take the charge of the barium and make that the subscript for the chloride ion. So if we have one barium ion and two chloride ions, then we've got positive two, and then we've got negative one times two, because we've got two chloride ions. And that would give us a zero charge. But what does that really look like? Let's say that I have my barium. Here are its two valence electrons. And then I've got a couple of chlorines. Hanging out. When these combine, let me label my chlorine atoms, barium is going to give one valence electron here and one valence electron here. So it becomes the barium ion and then we've got one chlorine or chloride ion at this point. and two, two chloride ions. This is barium chloride. 
So that's what happens. You've got those valence electrons from the barium atom being graciously donated to the chlorine atoms. Now, barium has lost two electrons. It becomes positively charged and it's hanging out with its newfound friends, the chloride ions, who have just become even happier because they each have a full octet and they're now negative ions. So I just wanted to give you a little depiction of you know, what happens when you're forming this ionic compound so that it makes sense why you need to have two chloride ions. Let's do another example. We've got potassium bromide. I'll show you a slightly different way to think about it, but we'll come up with the same answer as you would otherwise. If you take the name and break it apart and say potassium ion, bromide ion. That's our cation. That's our anion. Potassium, you look it up on the periodic table. It's in group 1A, which means it's got a 1 plus charge. Bromide. It's in group 7A. It's a nonmetal. For its charge, you take that 7, subtract 8, and you get minus 1 for its charge. Plus 1, minus 1. Looks like we can just put it together. And that's it. We've got a neutral formula unit. Now I'll draw it for you like I did before. There's our potassium atom. There's the bromine atom. Potassium is going to say, hey, you can have my electron. It's totally cool. I don't really want it anyway. It is a burden. All the upkeep, my goodness. Just, here you go. And the bromine says, oh yeah, sure. I'll lock it. I'll take it. I've already got all these other valence electrons to take care of. So one more ain't gonna do me no never mind. There you go. That is potassium chloride. Hopefully the visual helps. And that's the last time I'm gonna do it. That's a lot of drawing. Okay. Now let's do something a little bit more complicated. We've got chromium-2 nitride. We know that chromium-2 is our cation. The nitride is our anion. So let's write these out. Chromium-2, it's already telling you the charge and the name. simple. The only reason you might go to the periodic table is if you don't know the symbol for chromium. But when you see the charge in parentheses, that's the stock system. So you already know what the charge is without having to do any math. The nitride ion comes from nitrogen. Remember, you have to look at that root. So that's nitrogen. 
It's a group 5A element. Non-metal. So you take that 5, subtract 8, and you get the charge. Negative 3. If we just put one of each ion together, our charge would be negative one. So clearly we've got to do something different. We're going to do our same little trick. The charge on the chromium is going to become the subscript telling us how many nitrogen atoms we have. The charge on the nitride ion will tell us how many chromium-2 ions we have. And when you do the check to make sure, you've got 3 times a positive 2 is equal to positive 6. And you've got 2 times a negative 3, which gives you negative 6. If you add those two together, your charge is 0. That is the chemical formula for chromium-2 nitride. Ternary ionic compounds, pretty much the same thing. Cation name followed by the anion name. But this time, we're going to be involving those polyatomic anions. When you're naming these, make sure that you have your chart. Because you name them just like any other anion, only you just look it up on the chart. K we know is potassium, that's the potassium ion. ClO2, you would look that up on your chart. It's the chlorite ion. Get rid of the word ion, and there's your name. Second one, we've got cobalt. Cobalt is a transition metal. Remember, that's what TM is. So transition metal, we, we have exceptions. So there, there's zinc, silver, and cadmium. Nope, cobalt's not on that list. That means that we need to figure out what its charge is. Let's move on to the polyatomic anion. We've got ClO3. Look that up on your chart. That's the chlorate ion. The charge of the chlorate ion is negative one. Notice that there are three of them. So there's a negative three charge coming from all of the chlorate ions. There's only one cobalt ion so that cobalt must have a positive 3 charge. Because remember, when we add the charge from the cation and the charge from the anion, it's got to equal 0. So the name here is the cobalt 3 chlorate. 
that's the compound. Now we have to go in the opposite direction. We've got to write the chemical formula from the name. Same rules as the binary ionic compounds. Charges have to be equal. If they are already equal, when you just have one of each, you're golden, you're done. If not, you have to place parentheses around that polyatomic ion, and you have to have more than one. So let's do some examples. Calcium nitrate. You look up calcium. It's in group 2A. So that means the charge is going to be plus 2. Nitrate. You have to look that up on your chart. We've got a positive 2 and a negative 1. If we were to add those together, we get positive 1. That's not going to work. So we put parentheses around that nitrate, which is our polyatomic anion. Then we do the same trick as we did before. The charge of the calcium is going to become the subscript for the nitrate. That means that we've got two nitrate ions and one calcium ion. So plus two and then we've got 2 times negative 1. If you add all that together, you get 0. You have to use parentheses. It's just like in math. If you want everything to be multiplied by 2, you got to put all that everything into parentheses. Let's do another. We've got the iron 2 ion. That already tells us the charge in the name. Done. Phosphate ion. Look it up. If we were to add those together, oh, we'd get a minus 1. No good. So you write that polyatomic anion in parentheses, and then take the charge of the iron drop that down as the subscript for your phosphate ion. We do the same thing with the charge of the phosphate ion. We drop that down as our charge, or excuse me, as our subscript for the iron. Now you'll notice that sometimes I do that and sometimes I don't. If the charge on your anion is greater than minus 1, then you'll need to do this. So for nitrate, that was minus 1. You don't need to write a 1 as a subscript. If it's anything other than 1, you write it. Again, this will take practice. I always post practice problems on Blackboard, and we do practice in class. So make sure that you practice, 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 
and the rules will become quite easy. So there's our final answer. Moving on to molecular compounds, we've only got one flavor, and that's binary molecular. Remember that these compounds are just composed of two nonmetal elements. A molecule is the simplest representative particle of a binary molecular compound, which remember that abbreviation is BMC. I'm sure you'll see it somewhere. When you're naming these compounds, the first element is the the first element in the compound, you just use the name. The second element, you have the suffix IDE. If you have more than one of your first element, you're going to use one of these prefixes from the table. These are Greek prefixes. I'm sure you've seen them, especially if you did geometry in high school. It may be a little bit of a bad memory if you didn't like geometry. But these are the prefixes that we're using. You will not get these for the exam. So you do need to memorize these. But they're pretty simple, and you probably know most of them just from living anyway. So there's one exception. If there's only one atom of the first element, you don't use mono. That's always used for the second element if you've only got one. So this molecule here, CO, we've got one carbon and one oxygen, but we only say carbon monoxide. Same thing with this next molecule, XEF6. There's only one xenon, but you don't see mono, you just see xenon. And then you name the other part, the hexafluoride. Let's do some naming. We've got this compound. We start with the first element. First element is phosphorus. How many do we have? We have four. So we plop that prefix in front. Tetra means four. Second element is sulfur. We only want the first syllable, just like with naming the anions. So we'll take the sulf. Then you add IDE. How many do you have? You have three try tetraphosphorus trisulfide we'll do one more ccl4 there's only one carbon so we just write carbon cl4 4 is tetra then we take the root of the element named chlorine, so that's chlor, add IDE, carbon tetrachloride. With practice, it'll be very fluid. We've got a few more categories. We've got the binary acids, and then we have to do the ternary oxy acids. Remember, binary acid, I use BA. And that's just a hydrogen plus a nonmetal. Our example here is HCl. 
and it always has that AQ in parentheses to show that it's an aqueous acid. To name these acids, you're going to use the prefix hydro, then the element stem, or that first syllable, and then add ic acid. There's the hydro. And then for fluorine, you have fluor. Then you've got the ic acid. We've got iodine in this next one. So you've got hydro iodine. You take the iode, that's that first syllable, and you add the ic acid. So let's practice naming one. We start with hydro. This element here, this nonmetal, is bromine. We'll take the brome, add ic, and the word acid, hydrobromic acid. Ternary oxy acids are a little bit more complicated, but it's not bad. They're comprised of a hydrogen plus an oxy anion. And the naming is based on the ending of the oxy anion. If the, an the oxy anion that the acid is derived from ends in ATE, then the suffix is changed to IC and then acid. If we start with the nitrate ion and then we make it into an acid, you're going to get rid of the eight and the word ion. Add ic replace ion with acid, and that makes nitric acid. We do the same trick for ITE, only the suffix is O-U-S. So if we had NO2 minus and we made an acid, we take nitrite ion, get rid of the ITE, replace it with O-U-S. Replace the word ion with acid, and you get nitrous acid. This table gives you an example of naming ternary compounds. So we did not go over hypo and per. I'm not going to require you to know those but I want you to recognize them if you do encounter them in your homework, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. And if you continue on to take, um, you know, Chem 106 or 107, you'll definitely see it. So I just want you to be familiar. Let's practice naming some ternary oxy acids. Do not try this without your chart. ClO3. That's our oxy anion. The name of that oxy anion is the chlorate ion. Get rid of the ATE, replace it with IC. Ion gets replaced with acid. Chloric acid. This ion, PO4, 
that's the phosphate ion. Get rid of the ATE. Replace it with IC. Get rid of ion. Replace it with acid. This one is a little bit different because it's really phosphoric acid. It'd be a little bit difficult to say phosphic. <laughs> so we add a couple of letters there to make it a little bit easier to say. But I won't hold you. You get the idea. That's it for naming. That is the language of chemistry. It leads into chapter 7, which is chemical reactions. So balancing equations, writing equations, chemical equations in words, that kind of thing. So if you don't understand chapter 6, don't try to move on to chapter 7 until you do. Thanks for watching. Make sure you tune into the live lecture. We'll be doing a lot of practice. And then you'll always get details about assignments and exams. Until then, stay safe.